My name is Evelyn Vivar and I'm a CHCI Meta Graduate Fellow. I'm delighted to be with you here today for Protecting Puerto Rico's Environment session. During my undergrad career, I had the opportunity to intern at the Vieques Conservation and Historical Trust, where I had the chance to speak with many Vieques residents who spoke about their experiences after Hurricane Maria. It was clear to me that they were frustrated by the lack of resources and aid that they received after the hurricane, which is why today this panel is more relevant than ever. As our panelists will discuss real and tangible solutions their companies are taking to tackle climate change on the island, creating a positive relationship between the public and private companies. On behalf of CHCI, I would like to thank Starbucks, Transportation Institute, and Amgen for the generous support of this session. It is now my honor to introduce um, welcoming remarks from session chair, Representative Nidia Velasquez. Representative Velasquez represents New York's seventh congressional district. She was first elected in 1992 and was the first Puerto Rican woman elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. Representative Velasquez is the chairwoman of the House Sen Small oh, excuse me, Business Committee, a senior member of the Financial Services Committee, and a member of the House Committee on Natural Res Resources. And now, Congresswoman Nidia Velasquez. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Great. Thank you so much for that kind of introduction. Um, it is an honor to be surrounded by people determined to make a difference in my beloved island of Puerto Rico. As I reflected on the theme of this year's conference, I realized I do not know a nation as rooted in strength as Puerto Rico. Puerto Ricans have had no choice. An island suffering from colonialism as well as economic and social distress, the people of Puerto Rico have had to face numerous struggles. After Hurricane Maria and Irma, the history of Puerto Ricans changed forever. And although Puerto Ricans have managed to rise strong from adversity, the threats persist. Many of those lands and coasts that were devastated on September 21st, 2017, could be lost forever, especially if we fail to act on climate change and maintain the status quo. It is vital that we all continue to fight to protect the island's natural resources and stand up to environmental degradation that puts profit over human lives. This means the federal government must play a leading role in conducting oversight and working to correct decades of environmental injustices against the people of Puerto Rico. The islands of Vieques and Culebra, in terms of military practices, come to mind the type of environmental degradation that we, the federal government, subjected the people of Puerto Rico is shameful. And we have a moral obligation to address those issues. And from my position on the Committee of Natural Resources, I'm working to do just that. This past month, thanks to Congress oversight, the EPA issued a compliance order to two developers who were damaging a cave and contaminating beach waters in Aguadilla. I also sent a letter to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers asking that their flood control projects adhere to the principles of environmental justice, aiming to prevent the destruction of a natural reserve and the forced expropriation, expropriation of people. We must plan for a stronger future for Puerto Rico. The people of Puerto Rico deserve nothing less. One where the island's natural beauty and esteemed resources are safeguarded and shielded from unnecessary development and profit. This path is absolutely possible and essential 
so that Puerto Ricans can continue to achieve their dreams. Thank you so much for being here. And I thank all the members of the panel and everyone and every community organization that is working to empower the people of Puerto Rico. Thank you and God bless. You. Thank you, Congresswoman um, Nydia Velasquez. It is now my pleasure to introduce Kevin from Starbucks, who will walk us through a coffee tasting from the Yauco Selecto um, region. Thank you, everybody, and good morning. I hope everybody got a chance to have your um, cup of coffee in your hands. I will require your participation. At Starbucks, <laughs> um, this is the fun part. Every single thing that we do is really in coffee and connections. We have a very specific way to taste the coffee at Starbucks. We have four steps. I'm going to tell you the steps really quick, and then we're going to do four steps together. The first one is that we're going to smell the coffee. Second, we're going to slurp it. We're going to want to make a huge sound since this is a big room full of people. <laughs> <laughs> so please <clears throat> represent on that. We're going to locate after that, and the final step is we're going to describe. The coffee we're tasting today to honor Puerto Rico is a Starbucks Reserve Puerto Rico Yauco Selecto. This is the first time that I try, so we're all going to be learning this together. Uh, so please get your cup of coffee and put your hand on top of it because you want to get all the smell going to your nose. If this is your first time doing a coffee tasting, it might be hard to kind of like get the nuances of the coffee, but the more you do it, you become an expert. What I smell is a little bit of smokiness. I always like to say that I, I smell sweetness to the coffees, even though when you try, when you try it, it might be bitter. Um, and now we're going to make the big sound. Everybody, please make a big slurp. Everybody, your mom, your dad told you not to do. Today is the day to do it. Now we're going to locate. This coffee, uh, we talk about the body. Think about when you taste uh, orange juice versus, say, like a hot chocolate. The density of the coffee is pretty mild. It's a medium roast. Um, and it sits usually, in, depending on the coffee, this one, sh to me, sits towards the back. And it doesn't have a strong aftertaste. Um, we call that the coffee to be very elegant. And then to describe the coffee, we can think of words such as earthy, some chocolate notes, some maple notes, some nuttiness. Usually Latin American coffees are very well known to have chocolate notes and nuttiness. This is how we do coffee tasting at Starbucks, and I just wanted to say thank you, everybody, for having me, and just a little bit about myself. I'm here representing the Starbucks. I am from El Salvador originally. I immigrated to the US in 2007, 2007 when I was 21 years old. I always like to say that as I was learning English, I was learning all the Starbucks menu. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a true story. Um, Starbucks is all about the inc inclusion and diversity, and this coffee represents the resilience of Puerto Rican people because it's also the first coffee that was harvested after the Hurricane Maria, and you're going to hear more about that in the panel. Thank you so much for having me, and please enjoy the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, for walking us through that coffee tasting. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Nancy Santiago. Nancy is a seasoned professional with over two decades of experience in the areas of education, economic development, federal policy, and philanthropy. She served for two terms in the Obama administration and has been instrumental in the design and execution of key public policy and federal programs. Focused on aligning capital with justice, her leadership skills have been employed across the public and private sectors. Nancy current, currently serves in the Biden and Harris administration as a senior advisor and director of strategic partnerships for the Office of the U.S. Surgeon General. Prior to her current position at the Department of Health and Human Services, Nancy led the efforts to democratize economic opportunity at Hispanics and philanthropy. Please welcome Nancy Santiago. Thank you. 
Thank you, Evelyn. And uh, two things to kind of put out there. First of all, when she says two decades, I just realize how old I am. Um, <laughs> this is always hurtful. Uh, <laughs> but the other thing is, Kevin, thank you for the coffee tasting. I cheated. Because como buena puertorriqueña, azuquita para el café. Like you can't, you can't drink it without. So I literally snuck off stage and got my sugar. Um, so thank you all for being here today. I will say, very thrilled to hear all the references to Vieques. For those of us that were finishing graduate school and getting ourselves arrested in Vieques in 1993. Um, yeah, long time ago. And for those of us, because there's a couple of folks with Vieques ties in the island, it's really important for us to know that Vieques has not been forgotten. And now my own personal com commercial, having, you know, sitting from the post of the Office of the Surgeon General, the health inequities on the island are devastating. And the fact that we don't have a working hospital in Vieques is a real problem. So let me stop there, because I can get myself into a lot of trouble and shut up about that. <laughs> and let me welcome you guys here today to talk, um, to listen to our panelists, to ask some questions, to talk really about one of the most important issues of our lifetime, which is climate change. And I like to explain to folks when we talk about the environment and in Puerto Rico or any island nation, we are the canaries in the coal mine. We are the ones warning the rest of the world about what's happening and the pace at which it's happening because it happens to us first. And I think it's really important to understand that those of us that are sitting up here that live on the island, I go without electricity once a week, minimally. My office knows, Elia has been on calls. So I'm like, oh, Wi-Fi went down. Give me a second, I'll call you on my phone, right? This is our reality. And to quote a friend, um, to quote Lynn Manuel actually, Puerto Ricans are a very resilient people, but we should not have to be so resilient. So let's, I'm gonna lay it all out on the line so you know exactly where I come from. I will behave because I am representing the office of the Surgeon General. The Surgeon General is a good man. I don't want him to get in trouble for my mouth. So we will stick to the plan. Um, but I want to first welcome our panelists here today. I'm going to do brief introductions of them. And then I'm going to turn this over to them in many ways. We have a little bit of a shift in our schedule because our friend Ramon has to leave here a little earlier. So we're gonna allow him to speak first, which kind of works well, right? So we can get the subversive, complicated stuff over first. And then we can have more of the good news conversation with our panelists. <laughs> um, but let me introduce our panelists. So to my right, you have Jose Maeso. Jose is the business development manager at Crowley's new energy team in Puerto Rico, where he's been supporting the development of industrial and commercial microgrid and co-generation projects since 2018. Yes. In recent years, he has been the project director and director of business development for two federal sponsored programs, federally sponsored programs at the Puerto Rico Energy Center located at the University of Ana M. Endes, Guarabo Campus. Jose is a former executive director of the State Office of Energy Policy at the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. Thank you and welcome, Jose. Thank you. Thank you. Bienvenido, thank you. Gracias. Uh, next is Brenda Torres. Brenda is the site head of Amgen's flagship manufacturing site. She's the first woman from Puerto Rico to serve as vice president of operations. Uh, Brenda is a professional with over 25 years of experience in the biopharmaceutical industry. Prior to Amgen, Brenda worked at Abbott Laboratories, Pepsi-Cola, and Baxter Healthcare. Thank you very much for joining us. Jen, we have way too many conversations this morning about coffee, but Jen Berg is director of Government Affairs and Public Policy for Starbucks, where she manages federal government relations and global public policy. Prior to joining Starbucks in 2019, she was a senior member of the Williams Work Consulting Team focused on projects related to civic engagement and voting and recovery in Puerto Rico following Hurricane Maria. Thank you, Jen. And finally, please welcome Ramon Cruz, who will be leaving us soon, so I will start with you. <laughs> Ramon is president of the Sierra Club. He has over 20 years of experience intersecting the fields of sustainability, environmental policy, urban planning, energy, and climate change. He has worked for the public sector in his native Puerto Rico as the deputy director of the Environmental Quality Board, the State Environmental Regulatory Agency, as the commissioner of Puerto Rico Energy Commission. Thank you all. So, I do want to do a little bit of a commercial, right? I want to make sure that you have thoughtful questions for our panelists, so get them ready. Um, I want to make sure that you know that we are tweeting about the conference. I would ask, though, in my case, 
You can tweet about me, don't quote me. <laughs> um, but all jokes aside, uh, the hashtag is CHCIHHM for Hispanic Heritage Month 22. So please feel free to post. Um, and I want to do a little bit of a, like I said, a, a little bit of about me and why I'm here. Um, not going to be talking about health or health equity, which seems odd for the Office of the Surgeon General, but our office does focus quite a bit on the intersectionality of health outcomes and environmental justice. It's very real in the day to day. Uh, we saw a lot of this play out, quite honestly, during the pandemic, when we saw our communities shut down and some communities had more access to resources than others. Those of us that have been in some of the communities where we were watching, literally, I think about Jackson Heights in New York City, folks were without food for two weeks, right? So when you think about that and you think about everything that has to play into that, the systemic and historical and structural racism and environmental injustice issues, everything that leads us to moments like that, this is why this panel is here today. They're talking about all the pieces that they're working on individually within their organizations to kind of get us at justice for communities. Um, and the more kind of on the other side of the spectrum for me is I am a big fan of my island, right? And you, I hike, I rock climb, I've fallen off the, forgive me, because folks who know what I'm about to say know that this, I'm not being um, offensive, but I've fallen off the tetas of Camuy many, many times on a rope, <laughs> right? And if you guys know what that is, of Calle, if you know what those two big mountain peaks are for those of us who rock climb, yeah, so I have the scars to prove it, so just a good look. Um, I love my island, I love its environment, and I wish people could see the side of Puerto Rico that I see every day. And I fear that if we don't do something about the environmental problems on the island, you won't get to see the side of the island I see every day. So with that, I'm gonna start with you, Ramon. And I don't know if you'll be as subversive as I was, but let's, let's go. Um, let's start with what you know what you see, what you've done at the Sierra Club in general, but I'd like you to focus in on what you've seen and done in Puerto Rico specifically and talk to us a little bit about where we sit right now in terms of kind of this barometer of environmental dangers that we're witnessing on the island. Okay, well, thank you very much. And uh, hello, everyone. It's a great, uh, great honor to be here. And, uh, and uh, sorry that I will be leaving pretty soon. I wouldn't change this. Uh, audience for almost anything, but we're actually going to be, uh, today is the celebration on the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which is really the climate change uh, bill. So it's a historic, uh, you know, moment. And so, uh, so yeah, so at noon we have a meeting with the president. So otherwise, I would rather be here. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, and thanks for bringing Vieques. You know, I was one of those uh, we do have zip ties back too. Then, we have oh, zip ties. I served a couple <laughs> of days uh, in jail uh, back in, uh, you know, that was uh, 2000, the year oh, 2000. I did a little bit before so, that. Yeah, okay. 93. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so it was uh, it was a very uh, unique moment uh, for, uh, I think, one of the probably the only, together with uh, maybe energy costs, that has united different sectors of the. Puerto Rican uh, mm -hmm. society and uh, political spectrum uh, again. So that was actually uh, a very uh, important moment uh, for Puerto Rico. Uh, now, in terms of the Sierra Club, you know, uh, for those of you who do not know, Sierra Club is, uh, you know, the, the, the largest and uh, oldest environmental organization in the, in the nation. We have about 130 years uh, and uh, we do all kinds of things. You know, we have offices in every state, every major city of the of the U.S. Uh, I'm the first uh, Latinx to uh, to uh, occupy to, to to preside the Sierra Club uh, in that in that history. And so, you know, for a few for many years, we have been uh, shifting not only on environmental the the traditional environmental advocacy, but really centering equity and justice in everything we do. And, uh, and so that's, uh, that's very important because many people, you know, um, push basically saying, well, we should focus only on environmental issues. But, you know, what are environmental issues? What are environmental rights, you know, if they're not human rights, you know? So we believe that, you know, uh, uh, gender equality, reproductive rights, you know, immigrant mm -hmm. rights, 
uh, are human rights, you know? And so therefore, we cannot separate that. Uh, it was uh, very important after the murder of George Floyd and how many organizations, especially legacy organizations and all institutions in the US, you know, we have been, uh, you know, coping with, uh, you know, how, um, you know, systemic racism has, uh, you know, presented itself in, in our different organizations. And, and so, you know, many people, again, there was a pushback, especially from the very traditional members saying, well, we should stick, don't get into social, uh, you know, issues, justice issues. Uh, racism and you know the the fact is we cannot really um, you know fight the the climate crisis uh, unless we deal with uh, with systemic racism um, you know and that you know if if you think about how we allow to pollute you know watersheds how we allow to uh, mm. you know sacrifice so many places you know when when we do that then the people in those places become disposable, no? And you cannot really think of, uh, of uh, anybody as disposable people unless there's an ideology behind it uh, based on supremacy, no? And in the case of the US, uh, white supremacy. So you really have to dismantle those structures to really be able to, to really think, okay, well, there are some places that, some people that cannot be disposed of and some places that should not be sacrificed. And so coming from Puerto Rico, where I'm from originally, uh, you know, it has been a place that for many years, for many decades, uh, all through its history, has been actually a sacrifice zone. Uh, you know, when we, uh, when we think of Vieques, uh, you know, for uh, uh, military purposes, uh, when it comes for, uh, you know, when it comes to economic development, uh, pharmaceuticals, even tourism, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, uh, of uh, a pollution and contamination that has, a, you know, be all over uh, Puerto Rico for uh, so many decades. Uh, you know, so, uh, so that's something that, uh, that, you know, we're working, of course, to change. Um, you know, but unfortunately, I would say, and this is, I guess, the uh, more of the uh, not as optimistic as probably many people in the in the panel will be, but uh, um, you know it's not going well. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, in Puerto Rico, I don't think um, we have really learned from our mistakes in the pa from the past. Um, you have uh, Puerto Rico has great laws. It has a great uh, regulatory framework. Uh, it uh, unfortunately there is not a lot of consistency in uh, in following those laws. There's a lot of, uh, I think, uh, corruption and impunity uh, and lack of enforcement. Uh, so, you know, I, I know that we're going to hear from more promising, um, you know, examples uh, here. But, uh, but, you know, I think in, in terms of the role of the private sector, as important as it is, as important as public-private partnerships could be, uh, as I think as long as a private sector continues to uh, support uh, trade associations that oppose many of the environmental uh, regulations and laws that we need in Puerto Rico to be enforced, we're going to continue having the same problems. And so one uh, very recent example is the privatization. Am I running too, no, too no, long? No, no, no. That was unfortunately my phone. Thank God oh, Leah okay. turned it off. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. So please let me know and, and cut me when I when no, I No, there's there's be. a little bright tag there that somebody will hold up for you. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, all right. So uh, going back, you know, for example, the recent privatization of the uh, electric uh, company in Puerto Rico that was a public power, and of course there were many deficiencies there. People thought that oh, with privatization is going to be uh, fixed. And no, it actually got much worse. Uh, and uh, and with the, not only in terms of costs, uh, that of course that's also a big obstacle for investment in Puerto Rico, because especially for the private sector, the cost of doing business in Puerto Rico is much higher. Uh, and in great part has to do with that. And, um, and so, um, so in, in terms of the monopoly of the public company, that we had before, I, I think that, you know, worse than a public monopoly, a private monopoly is uh, probably even worse. It's much more secretive. Uh, the, the, you know, the 
we have seen, well, you mentioned how at least once a week you're, you have uh, cuts in, in that, in the, in the service. And so that is very problematic for, you know, for the economic future of Puerto Rico. Uh, and, um, and then a, a missed opportunity, you know, in an island where you have sun every day, uh, you know, you could have had investments uh, in solar energy that would have made it much easier. And I know that uh, uh, Jose Maeso will be, will, uh, I think, talking about microgrids and, uh, you know, ways of decentralize and make the, the power system more resilient. Uh, we had an opportunity to do, to do that uh, even more after Hurricane Maria. And uh, instead, we have a government that has a, a basically taken steps to lock us in a fossil fuel, a dirty uh, economy and a dirty future for another three decades, saying in the so-called natural gas, there's nothing natural about it. Mm -hmm. It's basically methane gas that it's as uh, bad as, uh, you know, and especially, you know, in, in the future when the whole a world is already transitioning to a clean economy. Uh, you know, if you would have told me that gas would be a transition a fuel, a, you know, 25 years ago in the 90s, I would have accepted that. You know, these days when you have most of the world already transitioning to uh, start uh, taking steps to uh, lock us into that future, a, you know, it's, 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 not, it's not believable. So unfortunately, the prospects of that for Puerto Rico is, is, uh, is very grim, you know, towards the future, uh, unless we take that back, you know, and start putting solar panels all over uh, Puerto Rico. You could have uh, leasing, you know, structures the same way that, uh, that uh, we see that in, uh, in other parts, and in Puerto Rico already, some private companies that have already uh, you know, you could uh, put in your roof solar panels and then uh, uh, lock you into a rate, you know, for a period of time. So there are ways of doing that uh, much better. Uh, other areas, for example, we have seen recently all the protests around uh, uh, development in the coastal area, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with uh, in places that are already being eroded, uh, you know, beaches that are being eroded, etc., and still there's impunity in, in all these developments uh, affecting the beaches. If we would have a good land use plan for the coastal zone, but every time we try to do it, when I was in government, there was a big effort, the last big effort to do that. And unfortunately, a lot of the private sector and the trade association is opposing that. Unless we have clear rules about that, you know, uh, we won't have good development. Mm -hmm. And so that is the problem, I think, uh, you know, from a legal and regulatory standpoint in, in Puerto Rico. So I would like to be much more, uh, uh, you know, optimistic. But unfortunately, uh, the government, and especially the current government, is not allowing me to do so. Well, uh, that's why we started with the bad news, right? We'll end on good news. <laughs> but, but let's go with that. Um, and I think you brought up something really important, right? So we do have private sector partners sitting up here who are attempting to do some right in, in a sea of what is grim news. Uh, so I want to give them an opportunity to talk about it, but I also want to talk about the importance of understanding that private sector can influence public opinion in many ways and can influence their industry partners. So I think that there's both good news, but also the opportunity to influence how other people do business on the island, which I think will be very important. So I want to talk a little bit about something that I'm brought up, um, the costs, just the energy costs, right? When we think about uh, the environmental needs, Com corporations also have environmental justice needs. So many business models can't work if we don't have the right resources. And I used the example earlier today of a company, a beverage company, many years ago that right after Hurricane Maria actually helped those of us who were working on the ground get the waiver that we needed for the Jones Act. And that beverage company, which shall remain nameless, is because they can't create their beverages without clean drinking water. So it benefited them to engage in the conversation about how you create safe, clean drinking water opportunities after something like a hurricane. So I want to talk a little bit about the business case. And I'm going to tap you, Jen, to, to help us get through some of that. What is the business case for doing right 
on the environment and for protecting Puerto Rico's climate. Um, You know, I think when it comes to coffee, when we're talking about Starbucks, um, the business case is everything, right? If there is no coffee, we can't run our business. Um, And Starbucks is working really hard to think about what is the sustainable future for coffee. The business case is just that, right? If coffee, if we lose coffee to rust and disease in the trees, to deforestation, to farmers around the world not having the support they need, we can't sell our product. So it's, you know, I mean, I think it's in some ways very um, foundational to think about the environment um, and to think about even more than that, in some ways, the farmers that uh, that are producing coffee around the world. And Por- Puerto Rico is no exception. Um, we had actually been in Puerto Rico since the early 2000s um, with one farm in particular, uh, Haciendo San Pedro, and uh, following the hurricane, um, went out and, and really surveyed the damage with them. 80% of, of the coffee farms in Puerto Rico were devastated after Hurricane Maria. That If that's not climate change impacting not only a business case, but the livelihoods of farmers and communities, I I don't know what is. Um, And so I'm happy to talk more about that through the process, but the short answer is the business case is everything to protecting the environment. It's everything. It's it's our our core business is coffee. Um, And our core business is the farmers and the people that sell the coffee. And so if we we don't have that, hard, hard for us to run a business and hard for us to do what we do best. Thank you. I was gonna ask the same question of Jose. Because you and Ramon alluded to some of it, right? So please. Ramon is a good friend, so <laughs> we've been we've been working together in, in some issues for, for many years. Uh, but yeah, in terms of, of the business case, uh, I would say, and he mentioned uh, some of that. Um, for for Crowley, and Crowley adopted recently, we did, did kind of a, a rebranding of, of all our values and purpose and all that. And one of the, of the three core values now is, is sustainability. But it's sustainability not only on the environment, but also on, on the people so, and, and on the business. So it's, it's all, you know, it's sustainable in, 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 many, in many other senses. So, so I would say, you know, starting with the people, you know, we, are, we um, embark on looking at what our uh, stakeholders were looking for. Like, you know, internal stakeholders, our people, our employees, and our external stakeholders, not only businesses, but our suppliers and all, all our partners. So with that, we identify, actually, and I was, I was a little impressed by this, what the people selected as, as the top things that Crowley should be focusing on. Reducing emissions, reducing energy use, uh, focusing on talent acquisition, diversity, inclusion, uh, and all, all the health and safety of the, of the employees, and offering sustainable solutions to our customers. So when we saw, obviously, that the stakeholders were asking us to do this, so that's, that's, a, that's a good business case. We're helping the people, we're helping the planet, and we're obviously helping the bottom line of the, of the, of the corporation as well there. And there are you know, a couple of, of, of examples. If, if we start, for example, tracking uh, emissions from you know, internal operations and our suppliers, there, we're helping uh, other companies do this, identify where can they reduce their carbon footprint, uh, do it for ourselves, but also this becomes now a new business line that we can help other businesses do the same thing. So, you know, with, with investing in people, we also um, become sustainable in acquiring the best talent, in maintaining the best talent, which is very difficult in, this, in these days. So, so that, you know, that is, what we have identified as a business case, and obviously helping our customers uh, on you know, things like uh, Ramon was mentioning, doing microgrids. I know, you know and, and he was talking about natural gas, that's a big part of our, our work uh, right now with the customer. For you to understand a little bit of that, the manufacturing sector in Puerto Rico, which is about half of the, of the economy, and, and Brenda can talk better than me about that, uh, cannot sustain their energy demand with just renewable energy. So we are supplying that baseload power for them to then can go and invest on microgrid so they can mix the fuel with the solar with other uh, uh, technologies. And I, I will stop there. And <laughs> no, <laughs> this leave, is very uh, helpful. And I'm actually going to, I did want to talk a little bit about 
your goals, right? Because you mentioned a goal that the company has. Yeah, yes. The company is, uh, uh, is um, set a goal of becoming um, carbon neutral by uh, 2050. And that, if you look into the maritime industry, which is a big chunk of, of Crowley's business, uh, that is very difficult on, on the maritime business because it already is as, as efficient as, as it could be. Uh, how we are um, attacking, let's say, and that, that sounds like a bad word, but como lo, lo pienso en español, como nosotros atacamos ese, ese problema, es, eh, por ejemplo, eh, we started ch changing our chips. The two chips that run from Jacksonville to Puerto Rico every week, twice a week, now run on LNG. I was, I was talking to Sara uh, before, which is better, burning seven days diesel from Jacksonville to Puerto Rico or burning two days natural gas, which is a lot cleaner than, than the diesel we were burning before. So those, those are the, the principles or, or the, the starting uh, uh, steps that we're doing towards reducing our carbon, carbon footprint and getting to that um, uh, net zero target, which uh, we actually put an interim target in 2025 to see how we're, we're, we're doing, but then the goal is on 2050 being uh, uh, net zero. Thank you. And I'm going to ask the same question, Brenda, around your goals and what you guys are doing at Amgen to, to get at some, to tackle. I'm pensando en la palabra en, en inglés, it's tackle. I was trying to think of what it was in English to change the channel. What, what Amgen is doing to tackle this very tackle. big problem. That's, that's the word. That's the word, right? And, and what your goals are. Please tell us a little bit about Amgen's efforts. Hi to all. Thank you for being here and joining us today. In Amgen, Puerto Rico, we have our environmental sustainability plan, which really will help to decrease the impact of the climate change. And we are working towards what we call a road to net zero. And that's our, our aspiration by 2027 is to have, to reach the carbon neutrality, to have a 40% of decrease on the consumption of water and to have a 75% of decrease on the waste disposal. So we are going there. And uh, as important as it is, uh, the company has raised a bond to have $750 million for all Amgen worldwide to support the environmental sustainability projects. So at this time in Amgen Puerto Rico, we are working with in the integration of the uh, liquid natural gas in which we are going to integrate that and make sure that our cogeneration plan runs with a cleaner combustible. But besides of that, we have been working for years on sustaining our environment and protecting our beloved Puerto Rico. And we are treating 100% of the water. We reuse our water, we recycle, but as well, we have uh, an integration on handling of organic waste to support the farmers in Puerto Rico. So you will be getting benefits from there. <laughs> This is excellent. And this is what I wanted you guys to hear. There is some good news. And we're hoping that the private sector helps us not just share their promising practices, but also influence outcomes. So let's talk a little bit about that and influencing not just your industry, Jen, but how do you get the community of Puerto Rico to help and surround and get you to these goals? Because I think that's an important part of it, right? Because your business is so customer facing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have perfect examples of it, right? Yeah. How do you, in your day-to-day, -day, engage community in reaching some of these goals that you've set? Yeah. Um, well, I think community and, you know, we say one cup, one neighborhood at, the t at a time, and that's truly how we work. There's a number of uh, baristas and store managers, right? raise your hand. You know, <laughs> these folks know their communities and their neighborhoods better than anyone else, and it's no different uh, when we think about our farmers um, and the farmer support centers that we have around the world, um, 10 actually, um, that are open source for any farmer to come in and learn from our agronomists mm -hmm. about how to think about uh, practices on their farm. Uh, Puerto Rico is an actually really wonderful example. I can take no credit for this. I'm nearly the messenger, but um, a, a, a colleague of mine at Starbucks, Kelly Goody John, um, after the hurricane, worked with a number of prop private partners, uh, including Puerto Rico Coffee Roasters, who's actually a competitor of ours on the island. Um, so this is pre-competitive, um, but uh, also with government 
um, and the University of Puerto Rico and World Coffee Research to actually form one task force and say, okay, what will it take to bring the coffee sector back in Puerto Rico? And you know, through that process with researchers, with private and public partners, they were able to expose some opportunities to actually bring it back stronger than it was before. So, you know, World Coffee Research was able to actually do DNA sampling of the varietals on the island to actually understand like what coffee is growing here. What are the opportunities to grow it back stronger? Um, but you know, that happens from a group of like-minded individuals caring about the industry. Uh, sitting together and open sourcing what we're learning, which is a huge part of what we really believe in, which is that open sourcing element. And in terms of the public-private aspect of this, one thing um, probably wonky policy people in this room know, but there is a, um, a subdivision of USDA called APHIS, and APHIS uh, helps to ensure the importation of uh, plant varieties uh, around the world but into the U.S. And when the coffee sector... Um, was devastated, you know, we needed to import seeds to Puerto Rico, coffee seeds, to rebuild the sector. And that took USDA and APHIS and private partners and government in Puerto Rico all working together to actually bring seeds onto the island safely. They have to quarantine, a word we all know now, um, and <laughs> incubate um, before they can be planted and be successful. But end to end, that process was as we all know, as government folks, takes a lot of buy-in and partnership end-to-end -to, -end to make that happen. And Puerto Rico coffee roasters imported seeds as well as Starbucks donating seeds. So it's a good example of how um, maybe alone, I'm not sure that would have happened. And alone has been, I don't think Starbucks could have done that alone. I don't know that the farmer on the island could have done that alone. I don't know that a government agency could necessarily do that alone, right? Um, so it's just a good example of how these things can work uh, when you have a shared vision and you're, you're really thinking pre-competitive and, and sort of open source. Thank you. Jose, I have kind of a similar question for you because I know that there are end outcome goals for your customers. You even talked about your customers wanting certain things. Yeah. So how do you partner with them to move the, one towards the goal that you have, but also to improving kind of outcomes broadly for Puerto Rico? What does it mean? I think folks forget that Crowley is an important part of the everyday Puerto Rican experience because yes. without Crowley, <laughs> there are no food coming to the island, there are no supplies yes. coming yeah. to the island. So about half us. of the supplies uh, arrive on Crowley ships. Correct. Uh, to Puerto so, Rico. Yeah. Right. so let's talk yes. about what that looks like for yes. the community. So I, I, I use uh, the example of the of the ships, but I want to talk to mention um, uh, two, two of the, the other, you know, things that are dear to my heart in terms of uh, what we're doing and, and, and the impact to, to Puerto Rico. One of those is Crowley is developing the first electrical tugboat uh, in, in the whole world. So mm -hmm. imagine, you know, you know what the tugboats are? Los remolcadores, mm -hmm. los que alan los barcos grandes. So, so those uh, uh, boats are, are starting to be developed and we will have next year the first electrical tugboat. It, unfortunately, it will not be for Puerto Rico. It will be first for California because they put the money to build it. Uh, but eventually that will start trickle down. After that right now, uh, what is moving is the ports are being electrified to allow for the electrical tugboats to be uh, charged. So that's another, you know, talking about innovation and technology and Crowley has, uh, has put a target of being the most innovative uh, um, company in the, in the maritime and logistics area. So that's one example. The other example I want to do, and this is very, very close to uh, Puerto Rico and all the citizens, especially in the East Coast. We are uh, supporting, and, and this is a company, you can look it up, it's Biomass Green Fuels, that is developing the first landfill in Puerto Rico, recovering landfill gas and turning that into renewable natural gas, renewable CO2, which is now from there, it goes to all the food manufacturing companies in Puerto Rico. They are uh, producing renewable, they call it renewable dry ice, and even filling uh, fire extinguishers with the CO2 that they uh, get out of the, of the landfill. With that, and I was reviewing my notes yesterday with the, with the developers on, on the landfill there, and they are reducing 90% of the total pollution that was going out of that landfill. This methane used to be burned for 30 years in the landfill, so that's cleaner air, a lot cleaner than, you know, than it was years before, 
And Crowley has committed to buy all the renewable natural gas they produce there, everything that they produce. And they have online uh, first two landfills, and they might go to seven landfills in Puerto Rico to recover that uh, methane and produce all these products. So that's, you know, that is very, very close. There are actually a big neighborhood just right by the landfill in, in Umacao in Puerto Rico. So that is impacted them directly in their air quality and the, and the quality of the, of the water and the area on, on there. So. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you, Jose. And, and I wanted to talk to Amgen about the same thing, because Amgen has kind of this community approach to how it's doing things and understanding that at the end of the day, the environmental changes that they're making to policy and practice impact customers in a positive way. So can we talk a little bit about that? Oh, the yes, community definitely. Uh, our goals are very clear, no? I, I told you, we are going to achieve the carbon neutrality, the 40% of reduction on, white, on water consumption and 75% reduction on waste disposal. That we believe will make the difference in our environment in Puerto Rico and will support other, other companies, no? That will, we, I'm gonna share with them all of these things that we are doing so they can uh, also uh, contribute to the Puerto Rico environmental. Thank you. I, I know that we're moving to questions and answers. And first I wanna thank the panelists for just doing what you've done, right? Both for your goals internally as a company, but for understanding that you guys are leading the charge, right? It's a heavy burden, uh, but I'm gonna leave it on your shoulders because if not, who's gonna do it? So thank you. Um, and I did wanna open up the floor for questions. Um, I know I have tons of them, but I've been talking too much, so it's up to you guys. Any questions for any of our panelists? I wanna make sure that we're giving a chance, thanks. And Jose is helping us here today. Thank you, Jose. So this is kind of directed at Jen, but uh, <laughs> that's only because I'm a partner. <clears throat> I'm a coffee master and shift supervisor from Denver. My name is Michael, and my family is from Denver and from Arecibo, cerca de Utuado, allá en Rio, Rio uh, Lago do Boca. Um, so I went back after Maria to plant those coffee trees we imported, and we quarantined. I want to know how companies that are as large as ours are going to invest time, effort, and energy to influence public opinion, work with Gustos and El Buen Café, all of the other ones to bring back things that have been lost. I'm from the capital of Seti. It's a tiny little fish that only shows up in one part of the island. Mm. They don't come back anymore. Mm. They're lost, who knows? So how do we as a company bring that back? How do we as a company work hard to stop that from loss, being lost in our culture? Because I go and I visit, <laughs> y me muero <laughs> to see my home getting destroyed. And everybody's in this fight for cryptocurrency and everything else, and they're losing the culture trying to get there. And I don't understand it. And I want to fight from Denver to get Puerto Rico back where it needs to be. I, I really, really <laughs> appreciate your perspective. Um, as a partner, you're sharing your own story, which is core to who we are, and that's where we always start. Um, so we have to honor and recognize that first, and no answer I'm gonna give is gonna meet what you feel uh, for your home and what's happening, and I think we all share that to some extent in our own communities watching ch climate change take root. Um, I think brands like Starbucks and all of us up here have a great, great responsibility to lead by example. We have responsibility to be intentional, transparent, accountable to the goals we set. That doesn't mean we're always gonna get it right. That doesn't mean we're gonna hit every goal we set, but the core principles that we try to hold ourselves to on things like climate change goals. I think we all have goals up here. We can all set goals. What does it look like to to be intentional, accountable, transparent about where we're headed, how we're doing with them, where we might fall short. Why, when we are successful, are we open sourcing? Are we sharing with others? Those are the core things I think we can do in any situation or in, on any issue um, and, and accept the responsibility of that big you know, brand names like Starbucks known around the world have in our communities. Because Starbucks is an interesting one in that everyone, you know, goes, walks by a Starbucks or, or knows the brand and has this personal implication to them. You know, that could make our responsibility greater, less great. I mean, everyone has a different opinion on that. But from my view, 
it means that we have responsibility in our local communities um, and around the world, right? So that's commitments as big as reducing, you know, carbon water waste by 50% to become resource positive to building greener stores in communities and, and uh, using renewable energy that's then outsourced and provided to the community, right? It's, it's all of those things. So I wish I had an answer that was like, this is the silver bullet. Um, it takes all of us. And you know, the other thing I will say is we're not, we're not gonna be able to do it alone. So to the point of influencing, you know, I think from the government affairs advocacy position, you know, Starbucks also always thinks about how we can use our voice to advocate for important issues as well. And certainly we wanna walk the walk, so we wanna make sure we're doing the work. Um, but then we'll certainly use our voice if there are issues we think that we can impact, uh, have meaningful impact on, and then uh, influence others or compel others to join us. I believe that together we can do more, no? So we are responsible as well to motivate others, engage other people, support the nonprofit organizations that are educating the communities, the places that they are trying to transform. We should be able to put our part so everybody can get uh, the benefit. Uh, we cannot uh, let this go alone and take in their own course. We can make the difference. And I know that with this intention that we have this purpose of helping and protecting the environment in Puerto Rico, you know, it's, it's, it's a whole purpose no, for everybody here. Please, I, I want to respond to you just a little bit because I think that there's a few different things I want to make sure. Now I am putting on my Office of the Surgeon General hat for a moment. First of all, you almost made me cry, don't do that because I have mascara on today. <laughs> so let's start with that. But I agree with you. And I think that we also have to take into account that right now the people of Puerto Rico are continuing to work on their survival. It is hard to focus on big vision when you're trying to eat. Let's be very clear. We're working off of a longer than 25 year recession, then a category five storm that knocked out the island for months. Then the earthquakes. Please don't forget the earthquakes that started in early 2020 and then a pandemic. So where we're talking about multiple traumas to the people of Puerto Rico, I'm not exaggerating. And the ability to figure out how we survive that really is how do we heal from some of that? And how do we build a sense of community and connection that we're all in this together? It is hard to get us focused on one big goal, like how do we save the island when everybody's just trying to figure out how they survive the day. So I think that's an important piece. Um, there was another question here. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, I, you almost answered it. You know, oh, it's, it's crazy how uh, climate change has become politicized here. And so I was wondering if on the island, you have that same, when you're working with your communities, when you're working with your customers, do you all see that same kind of division, whether it's political or generational in terms of how much people care? Or is it maybe just people who are going through more trauma than others or who have earned a better place? Like what are kind of the shifts in who's able to make this commitment to, to fighting climate change? I'd love to be able to have Jose answer that. And I wanna be able to say that I'm proud of Puerto Rico because when it came to the pandemic, there was no politicization, pol pol not politiqueria, related <laughs> to That's the vaccination. Word to be quite honest. And I was very proud of how we wiped that out and said, no, 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 no. We don't have enough hospitals to serve people. Our big goal is to keep people healthy. This is not gonna become a political conversation. So I'm hoping we have the fortitude to do the same thing around climate change. But I wanted to pitch it to Jose, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, I, I would say on the environment, there's not a political division. I would say maybe uh, generational could be, uh, especially things as, as Ramon was mentioning, uh, you know, Let's go, and we have a new law from a couple of years ago to go to 100% renewable energy to 2050. And there are steps that are needed, you know, to, to get there, especially for the, as I was telling, uh, for the manufacturing sector. So on that, I don't think we have 100% agreement on, you know, there are environmentalists there that they don't like uh, wind turbines. So for example, that, that's kind of odd, you know, for, for me and for some, for some other people that, and I understand, you know, land use and, uh, you know, impact to the, to the uh, views, which are great and the best <laughs> in the world. Uh, <laughs> but but I, I would say on that, I don't think there's an agreement, but I don't think it's, it's, it's such, uh, I, don't, I don't think it's political. I think it's more, you know, uh, societal or, or, or generational maybe. I think generational is an important point. And that's all we have one minute left. Am I, is that right? So for us, I think, first of all, thank you very, very much for bringing us some good news and promising practices yes. because we needed it. 
especially after Ramon and I kind of just <laughs> bombed up here because we made it all very doom and gloom, we do have a big problem ahead of us. The one thing I'm always excited about, in addition to promising practices by some of our private sector leaders, is the young community in Puerto Rico who has taken the reins. Um, and I would ask that if any of you are paying attention to what's happening on the island, young people are looking for their voice. Um, oftentimes it gets opaqued by the bigger voices that exist on the island, but make no mistake about it, they're moving things and they're organizing in a way I've never seen before. Um, and I'm always very proud of that. I ask that you guys please just stay involved and ask questions. If you do nothing else but ask one question about Puerto Rico in every session you guys go to, whether it's racism, a structural and historic kind of marginalized groups, we fit in all those categories, so there's a way to ask a question. Ask the question, please don't forget about us. And as a young woman in Puerto Rico reminded me lately, every time somebody mentions us, it's like the Coco movie, we continue to exist, right? <laughs> so please talk about Puerto Rico, ask the questions, and thank you very much for being here today. Gracias.